My name is Father Roger Landry. I'm a pastor and a newspaper editor in the Diocese of Fall River, Massachusetts. Today I'm going to be beginning with you a three-part mini-series on the Word of God and the life and the mission of the Church and hopefully in your life and mine and both of our missions. I'm going to be basing my comments on the apostolic exhortation Pope Benedict published on November 11, 2010 entitled Verbum Domini, which is a Latin expression for the Word of the Lord. Like all papal documents, the title comes from the first words with which the document begins. In this case, an expression from St. Peter's first letter saying, The word of the Lord abides forever. This word is the gospel that's been proclaimed to you. In our study together, we're going to be breaking down Pope Benedict's insights into three parts, just as he divided the apostolic exhortation. Today, we're going to focus on the word of God itself, or better, himself, the God who speaks to us, our response to the God who speaks to us, and how to interpret what he says to us. Next time, we'll concentrate on the Word of God in the Church, on how the Church receives the Word, celebrates it in the liturgy, the sacraments, and other ways, and how the Word is meant to be the soul of all that the Church does in our pastoral work, our teaching of the faith, in our prayer, and in our daily life, whether we're priests, religious, lay people, old, young, married, or single. The Pope gives a lot of excellent suggestions you'll want to hear. In our third time together, we'll examine how the interaction between the Word of God and the world we live in occurs. How each of us in the church has received the mission from the Lord Jesus to proclaim His Word to every creature, both by our words and by our witness. We'll look at how the Word of God is meant to lead us to a commitment to true justice in society, to help reconcile those peoples and nations that are estranged, how it's supposed to lead to our greater love for young people, for immigrants, for those who are suffering and poor, to appreciate and take better care of creation. We'll also see how the Word of God has been and is supposed to continue to inspire a culture and cultural expressions in the arts as well as be a starting point for Christian conversations with Jews, Muslims, and those of other religions. We've obviously got a lot to cover. The Pope has given us a lot of food. I can't cover everything, but I hope to tackle the most important themes. Pope Benedict has given us the greatest, the longest, and the most specific document in papal history on sacred scripture. And what he says will help all of us make the Word of God a more central part of our Christian life. Before we jump into the first section on the Word of God who speaks to us and how we respond to and interpret that Word, I'd like to give you a little background to the document so that you can better understand its context. It's called a post-synodal apostolic exhortation, which is a fancy expression that basically means that the Pope's words are flowing from the insights of a synod, a convention of bishops from around the world that was held October 5th to 26, 2008, in the Vatican. The Synod was entitled, The Word of God and the Life and the Mission of the Church. And these bishops from all over the world engaged in three weeks of intense prayer and discussions and writing. In the first week, each bishop, as well as some biblical experts and other invited guests, like our Protestant brothers and sisters and elder brothers in the faith, some Jewish rabbis, would give a brief talk on something they considered of crucial importance. And then in the second and third weeks, they broke into small language groups to discuss what everyone had said. And they worked together on a list of proposals to the Holy Father about what we should do as a church moving forward. Altogether, the bishops of the Synod formulated 55 such proposals that they gave to Pope Benedict, which he prayed about, and many of which he incorporated into Verbum Domini, the document we're talking about. The audience of this apostolic exhortation are bishops, clergy, consecrated persons, and lay faithful across the world. Basically, all of us. And the purpose of the exhortation, Pope Benedict says, was to have a real effect on the life of the church, on our personal relationship with the sacred scriptures, on their interpretation in the liturgy and in catechesis, and in study of the Bible. So that the Bible may not simply be a word from the past, but a living and timely word for us today. The Synod Fathers declared that the basic aim of their assembly was to renew the church's faith in the Word of God. 
And this is a crucial thing because during the time of the Synod, there was the first international poll of Catholics in countries throughout the world. It was done by one of the International Catholic Bible Associations. And it surveyed those Catholics who come to Mass every Sunday, those we would call in some sense the creme de la creme, those who are practicing the faith. And in that survey, we discovered that across the world, only 3% of Catholics who come to Mass on Sunday ever have any contact with the Word of God throughout the rest of the week. One out of 33 good Catholics actually allow the Bible to influence the rest of their week. And that's why what the Holy Father and the bishops from around the world have given us is so important. It's urgent for us to return the Bible to its proper place in our Christian life. I'd like to strongly encourage you to get a copy of Verbum Domini and read it yourself, perhaps use it to follow along these talks. You can find it easily on the Vatican's website or by typing Verbum Domini into a search engine on your computer. If you don't have a computer or don't know how to do this, ask a young member of your family to do it for you. It might just interest them, too, in what we're discussing. So let's turn to the document itself at the beginning of Verbum Domini. The Holy Father sets the stage, introducing some of the major thoughts he's going to discuss with us. First, God reveals himself. We find ourselves before the mystery of God, who has made himself known through the mystery of his word. That God doesn't just come in words, but in person. That God spoke his word humanly. His word became flesh in Jesus Christ. This is the good news. Pope Benedict wished to focus on certain fundamental approaches to a rediscovery of God's word in the life of the church, as well as a wellspring of constant renewal so that the word will be ever more fully at the heart of every activity in the church. The second thought was that the word of God should bring joy. Sharing in the life of God, the life of the Trinity, is complete joy, and we do that through the encounter we have with God through his word. He has given us the words of eternal life precisely so that we might enter into eternal life. Pope Benedict says there's no greater priority than this to enable the people of our time once more to encounter God, the God who speaks to us and shares his love, so that we might have life in abundance. One of the bishops at the Synod talked about the joy that should flow from the, this encounter with the Word of God. Bishop Anton Eust of Yelgava, Eust, Latvia, in one very moving intervention, talked about the treasure of the Word of God and the joy of being able to receive it. He told the bishops of the priests, the men and the women who died in Latvia for proclaiming the word of God. He said during those deliberations that he remembered one Latvian priest named Victors, who during the Soviet regime in Latvia was arrested for possessing the Holy Bible. In the eyes of the Soviet agents, the Holy Scriptures were an anti-revolutionary book. The agents threw the Holy Scriptures on the floor and ordered, ordered the priest to step on it. The priest refused and instead knelt down and kissed the book. For this gesture, Father Victors was condemned to 10 years of hard labor in Siberia. 10 years later, when he returned to his parish and celebrated Holy Mass, he read the Holy Gospel. Then he lifted up the lectionary and said the word of God. And the people cried and thanked God. The word of God they knew was a treasure worth suffering for. Even the tortures of a decade in a brutal Siberian labor camp. It was worth getting down on one's knees to kiss. It contained within the open secrets of a new and definitive revolution. Father Victors clearly knew that the value of the Word of God was so great that he became a living witness to its inestimable value. And he was not alone in his testimony. In Latvia during the Soviet era, Bishop Eust continued. No religious books, no holy scriptures, no catechisms were allowed to be printed. The Soviet's reasoning was, if there's no printed word of God, there will be no religion. So the Latvian people did what the first century Christians did. They learned the passages of the Holy Bible by heart. Bishop Hughes said that still today in Latvia, there's an oral tradition alive, and that the Christians today stand on the shoulders of the martyrs to proclaim the word of God that the grandchildren remember their grandfathers and grandmothers who died for our faith 
and they want to be in their turn heroes of faith. In Latvia, he said to the bishops, we proclaim the living word of God. We go in processions and on pilgrimages. We sing songs and we pray and we say, this is the word of God for which our grandparents died. A people learning sacred scripture by heart, taking the Bible on pilgrimages, proclaiming proudly the word of God and seeking to be heroes and witness to it. This is what the Catholic Church is meant to be. As these faithful Latvians demonstrate, the Bible is not a dead document, but a living word. Since the word of God is not principally a book or a series of books, but a person, the incarnate word, Jesus himself, whom we encounter through the Bible's sacred words. To guide the journey Pope Benedict wants to lead us on during this apostolic exhortation, he takes it from the prologue or the first chapter of St. John's Gospel, which provides the structure of the encyclical. Part one is based on focusing on the word. And at the beginning of St. John's Gospel, we hear those famous words, in the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God, and that word became flesh. In the second part, but to all who received him, he gave the power to become children of God, which is the 12th verse of that prologue. And that's where we focus how as a church we seek to receive the Lord and become truly God's children, not just in name, but in fact. And in the third part, no one has ever seen God. It is God, the only Son, who is close to the Father's heart, who has made him known. And we continue that revelation of God the Father's love as we live the Word of God in our daily life. The prologue of St. John's Gospel, Pope Benedict tells us, makes us know the true basis of our life. The Word who from the beginning is with God, who became flesh and who made his dwelling among us. Benedict calls this prologue a magnificent text, one which offers a synthesis of the entire Christian faith. We're called to imitate the beloved disciple St. John, who saw and believed in Christ the Word, who leaned on Jesus' breast during the Last Supper, and who spent his entire life into his 90s spreading Jesus' love. And when we come back, we will break into that section on the God who speaks to us and how we're called to respond to him and understand his word.